In the 1950s into the 1960s, the dominant genre on the American television was the Western. In the cinema, Westerns were insanely popular from the 1920s onwards, most of all in the 1950s. There was no chance that television wasn't going to ride that bronco. Syndicated poverty row Westerns were already doing well. They introduced baby boomers to heroes like Hopalong Cassidy and the Durango Kid. TV Western series exploded on the screens in the USA. In 1956, when Australian television started, we joined that viewing stampede. So here are my top 10 TV Westerns of the 50s and 60s in no particular order. Who is the tall dark stranger there? Maverick is the name. Riding the trails of who knows where? Luck is his companion. Gambling is his game. Maverick was a one-hour Warner Brothers TV show. It was a creation of one of the most successful writer-producers at the time, a guy called Roy Huggins. During a long career, Huggins created a lot of hit shows, The Rockford Files, The Fugitive, 77 Sunset Strip, and one of my favourite TV shows of all time called Run For Your Life. Maverick had four leading men all up. In the beginning, it was James Garner as Brett Maverick. Brett was a poker player who gambled around the Old Western on Mississippi riverboats. He played cards, romanced beautiful women, and encountered bad guys and con artists. It was a standard format for the Western at the time. But unlike other Western shows, Maverick didn't take itself seriously. Episodes played with absurd plot twists and outrageous characters, and a lot of humour. In the eighth episode of the first season, they introduced Brett's brother, Bart Maverick, played by Jack Kelly. The two actors tag-teamed alternate weeks and sometimes shared an episode. When Garner left the show in Series 3, they brought in a cousin, Bo Maverick, played by Roger Moore. Now, strangely enough, Warner Brothers originally wanted Sean Connery, who accepted their free airline ticket to LA but didn't sign up. In Season 4, a third brother, Brent, appeared. He was played by an actor called Robert Colbert, who was later in The Time Tunnel. Most people remember and love the James Garner episodes, however. Garner's laid-back persona and comedic timing made the character really work. And like all good Western TV shows, Maverick had a cool theme song. There were attempts to bring back the show in the 1970s and the 80s with some of the original actors, but the magic just wasn't there. And the less said about the 1994 Maverick movie with Mel Gibson, the better. Yancey Derringer was half-hour western set in New Orleans, which isn't very west. Jock Mahoney starred as the titular character. Now, Derringer was an unpaid secret agent for the Federal City Administrator for New Orleans. He dealt with carpetbaggers and con men in antebellum Louisiana. Assisting him was his Pawnee Indian companion, Pahu Katawa, played by a guy called X Brands. Mahoney started out as a stuntman after he left the Marine Corps in World War II. He became an actor in some Three Stooges comedies in the late 40s before taking on leading roles. He then went on to be the oldest person ever to play Tarzan. He was 43 when he made Tarzan Goes to India in 1962. He was 44 in 1963 when he made Tarzan's Three Challenges. You should check them out. They're pretty good action films. X Brands, who played Pahu, wasn't a Native American, but a white guy of German ancestry from Kansas City. In spite of this, the actor received a positive response from Pawnee Native Americans. They thanked him for speaking their language accurately and giving the character dignity. Like Maverick, Nancy Derringer had a light touch at times. Made on a small budget at Desilu Studios, it's surprisingly amusing and fun to watch. A quick YouTube search should get you some episodes of it. One of the main genres of children's TV shows in the 50s was the Boy and His Dog Show. Lassie was the archetypal example of that, but then we had Rin Tin Tin, set in the US Army Fort in the Old West. But there was only one Boy and His Elephant Show, and that was Circus Boy. The concept is simple. A kid called Corky, Mickey Braddock, is a child of the Flying Falcons, an 1890s circus trapeze act. His parents die in a trapeze accident. He's adopted by Joey the Clown, Noah Beery Jr., and becomes a part of the Burke and Walsh Circus family. Circus Boy comes from an era before Stephen King ruined clowns for everyone. Corky's guardian, Joey the Clown, is a good, patient, compassionate parent. Corky adopts an orphan of his own, Bimbo the Baby Elephant. The circus was run by Big Tim champion, Robert Lowry. 
I travelled the West in the 1890s and, of course, adventures occurred. I, but I know what you're thinking. Corgi's story sounds a lot like Dick Grayson, a.k.a. Robin. Yes, it does, but that's not the only Batman link that Circus Boy has. The actor playing Big Tim Champion, Robert Lowry, has his place in Batman history as well. He was the second man to ever play Batman, starring in the 1948 movie serial Batman and Robin. Ten years after Circus Boy ended, Mickey Braddock went on to be Mickey Dolenz in The Monkey. This is a great old series, and uh, if you can get over the fear of clowns, I think you'll find it quite amusing. Steve McQueen as a bounty hunter. Yeah, I am there. Steve McQueen toting a mare's leg sawn off Winchester carbine in a hip holster while playing a bounty hunter. What's not to love? McQueen brought cool to TV westerns before Wanted Dead or Alive. His only important role was playing a 28-year-old teenager in The Blob. This series made him a star. In Wanted Dead or Alive, he plays Josh Randall, an ex-Confederate bounty hunter in the post-Civil War West. To stretch the concept, Randall ends up being like a kind of Wild West private eye. He finds missing people, he frees unjustly imprisoned men, and he took shit from nobody. McQueen credited Wanted Dead or Alive with teaching him how to act. He said, It was three hard mother-grabbing years, but I learned my trade and it gave me discipline. His breakout movie role in The Magnificent Seven was made during a break in filming Wanted Dead or Alive. McQueen left the series a year later and went on to make The Great Escape, Bullet and The Thomas Crown Affair. So props to Wanted Dead or Alive for that. The guest stars on the show were amazing. Lon Chaney Jr., James Coburn, Charles Bronson, DeForest Kelly, Martin Landau, Warren Oates, Lee Van Cleef, and Mary Tyler Moore. In 1987, the series was colorized for syndication. People should find the people who did that colorization and take them on a one-way trip in a rowboat. The real-life Bat Masterson was nothing like the TV version. In reality, he was a buffalo hunter, a gunslinger, a frontier marshal, a gambler, and one of the first sports journalists ever. He looked like this. Gene Barry, who played him in TV, looked like this. His masterson wore the clothing of an East Coast dandy. He was more likely to defeat the bad guys with a cane he carried than his gun. Now, this was necessary because TV westerns had to be kid-friendly, all the merch at the time, and there was a lot of it, was aimed at children. Because of this, the censors demanded that Western heroes weren't too violent. Punching out cattle rustlers was okay. This kind of shit wasn't. So Bat Masterson used his smarts and his cane to defeat the baddies. It makes me wonder how many kids try to beat school bullies to death with toy canes after watching the show. It also makes me wonder how many former school bullies are now scared of walking sticks and derby hats. Lorena was a humorous spin-off series from a much more turgid series of westerns called The Virginian. I like the exciting still shot intro with the funky music theme by Russell Garcia. Most of all, I like Lorena because it has two of the three leads that are character actors I really like. Laredo's premise is simple. A band of Texas Rangers led by Captain Parmalee, played by Philip Carey, work out of the titular town. That's it. The producers wanted the three leads to have the same camaraderie as the three soldiers in the classic film Gunga Din. It was a good choice too. Gunga Din's one of the best adventure films of the 1930s. It does, however, lose points because the South Asian character of the title was played by a Russian Jewish guy from New York called Sam Jaffe. But back to Laredo. First of the three main actors is Neville Brand, one of the most highly decorated American soldiers in World War II. Brand played a number of villain roles in his long acting career. He even killed Elvis in Love Me Tender. In real life, Brand was also a bibliophile and at one time had a library of 30,000 books in his home. Unfortunately, his books were lost in, in the house fire in Malibu in 1978. Brand plays Reese Bennett, who's almost the comic relief character of the trio. The second actor in the series is Peter Brown, an actor who played a second fiddle to John Russell in another Western series earlier called The Lawman from the late 1950s. What I know of Peter Brown for more than anything else 
is that he's a bad guy who gets his dick cut off by Pam Greer in the classic 1970s black exploitation movie Foxy Brown. It's a horrible thing to be remembered for, but that's how I remember Peter Brown. In Laredo, Peter Brown plays Chad Cooper. The third one of the series is William Smith, a big muscular character actor who spent most of his career playing angry macho dickheads. In the classic Robert Klaus movie Darker Than Amber in 1968, he has a brutal fistfight with Rod Taylor. Check out his filmography on IMDb, and if you like 1960s and 1970s exploitation cinema, he's all over it. He plays a character called Joe Riley. The three of them get into trouble, usually about money. Joe and Chad convince Reese to do something stupid to help them. Everything goes wrong, but they somehow survive it. It's a very tongue-in-cheek series, but a lot of fun, and I have fond memories of it. There are a lot of episodes on YouTube, so you should be able to find it without too much trouble. If I was going to do this video as a hierarchical 1 to 10, Have Gone Will Travel will be number 1. The earliest piece of clothing I can remember owning back in the dim, dark, early 1960s was a Have Gone Will Travel t-shirt. When I grew out of the t-shirt, I was devastated. Part of me will always miss that t-shirt. In this classic western series, Richard Boone plays a gun for hire called Paladin. He lives in the Hotel Carlton in San Francisco. His business cards are simple. Have gun, will travel, wire, Paladin, San Francisco. His usual fee was $1,000, but he often worked pro bono for those who needed his help. As the title song states, Paladin was a knight without armour in a savage land. The series ran for six seasons with tightly plotted 25-minute episodes. It was first offered to Western movie star Randolph Scott. You do it for Randolph Scott. Randolph Scott. Who declined. Scott was working with Richard Boone on a movie called Ten Wanted Men at the time and gave Boone the script. He liked it and he got the role. Trained in the actor's studio, Boone was a powerful presence on screen. He was one of those actors who could make non-actors wish they were on the stage. He could be charming and charismatic, intense and dangerous, erudite and educated. The character of Paladin was a man of learning, a philosopher knight in the Old West. That made him one of the more interesting characters in the genre at the time. His complexity took what might have been ordinary plots and situations and gave them an extra dimension. Episodes of the show were directed by famous people like Ida Lupino, Sam Peckinpah and Boone himself. It is a true television classic. Look around YouTube and you might find Have Gun Will Travel. It's worth searching for. You'll also find episodes of an anthology TV series that Richard Boone did afterwards called The Richard Boone Show. Great television drama. Not many television shows helped spawn a new genre. The Wild Wild West, which started out as being James Bond on horseback, actually did. Jim West, Robert Conrad, a Secret Service agent, travels around the American West in his own railway train. Assisted by his inventor, master of disguise, friend Artemis Gordon, he foils all manner of devious plots to harm the nation. The Wild Wild West was full of technological anachronisms with a Jules Verne feel about them. Jim West's nemesis, his Professor Moriarty, was a genius called Dr. Miguelito Quixote Loveless, played by Michael Dunn, an actor with dwarfism. Loveless with his huge henchman Voltaire, played by Richard Keel, and his companion Antoinette, played by Phoebe Doran, plotted to take over America, if not the world, several times. In watching the series, we see some other aspects to Michael Dunn, which I find very interesting. He was actually a folk singer with Phoebe Doran, and they get to sing some folk songs and old madrigals and things like that during the series. It's a really interesting character, and it gave a person with disability a chance to shine as an actor, and Michael Dunn was a very fine actor. The other villains and their traps were part of the fun of the series too. We had Agnes Moorhead, Ida Lupino, Victor Buono, Boris Karloff, Ed Asner and Ricardo Montalban all playing villains in the Wild Wild West. The Wild Wild West has been seen as one of the seminal influences on steampunk. The series was cancelled in 1969 because of another crusade against violence on television. In the subsequent decades there were two telemovie revivals of the show which weren't very successful and the less said about the 1999 Wild Wild West movie 
the better. I'm not usually a big Disney fan. I think the last good Disney movie was this one made in 1948. We're three caballeros, three gay caballeros. They say we are birds of a feather. However, I did like a 1950s Disney TV series, Zorro, based on Johnston McCulley's stories, which first appeared in 1919. It's the Robin Hood story of Don Diego de la Vega, who returns from Spain to his home in California before the Anglos took it over. He finds the commoners and indigenous people are being impressed by the Spanish officials running Los Angeles. Diego pretends to be a foppish, effeminate nobleman by day, and by night he becomes Zorro, defender of the poor and oppressed. Dressed in black and wearing a mask and wielding a sword, he was great for merchandising to children, which is what Disney was all about. Audiences were already familiar with the character because there were some very successful movies in the past. There was a version of The Mark of Zorro in 1920 starring Douglas Fairbanks and a sound remake in 1940 with Tyrone Power. The TV series starred Guy Williams, an actor model of Sicilian descent. Zorro was an unusual series for the time. It had plot arcs over 13 episodes, making it almost like a movie serial back in the day. The intention was to keep kids watching each week to see what happens, and it worked. William Zorro played down the effeminate aspects of Don Diego's masquerade, but he was a charming lead in the role. Very few Hispanic actors appeared in the series, but it was made at a time when ethnic casting was the exception rather than the rule. Disney's studio facilities made Zorro a good-looking series, and it was wildly popular with children. In fact, I went to a masquerade party when I was eight years old dressed as Zorro. No photographs were taken, but I did really rock the eyeliner moustache. In the class if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button and subscribe. You can also find my movie podcasts at paleocinema.podbean.com and martiandrivein.podbean.com. There's also a Patreon fund at patreon.com slash paleocinema. I hope you enjoyed the video and I will be back with another one in a week or two. Thank you.